Hey guys, this is Lucid. Uh, welcome to the next episode in our guide series. We're going to be talking about the middle game here, uh, and we're going to cover a lot of things. I think this is going to be the most important of all the guides I've done, just in the sense that this is kind of the most technically interesting part of the game. It's the part of the game where it really diverges from playing against single player, um, and the middle game is very much like the late game. Uh, in that the late game is just an exaggeration of everything you see in the mid game. Uh, but the mid game is very different than the early game. And we'll talk about what I mean by all this. But I think, uh, I think if you have a solid grasp, and, and I'm not going to be able to talk about everything in a ton of depth, um, uh, but if you have a solid grasp of everything I'm going to talk about in this, uh, then you have a very good chance of winning a multiplayer game. Okay, so first, what is the mid-game? Uh, you can kind of argue when the mid-game starts. Uh, I would say it starts around year two, which is turn 24 uh, here in this game. This is a game I subbed into for a hot minute, but um, this is turn 36. So uh, yeah, we'll, we'll just use this as a little setup ground. I just need, I want to have something up to, to show you guys. Uh, this is, is a, I haven't really prepared this as an example, but it, it starts at about turn 24, uh, but it really goes to about, I would say late mid-game is usually around uh, 55 or 60, uh, and about then is when late game starts picking up. So what, what differentiates these phases? Uh, well, usually around turn 24, you start having some key research coming online where your nation is no longer really defined by what you start the game with. You know, it's not really defined anymore only by... Um, you're starting troops, and your pretender god, it is now defined very heavily by what you've chosen to research um, and what you can do with your mages based on that. It's It kind of ends. Uh, the late game is really when you're more or less expected to have all the major research done that you're going to need, like a lot of the key research done. People are, if you had a big research advantage, it's going to start kind of diminishing as other uh, nations might catch up in research and have hit ma uh, some of their major targets. Uh, a lot of nations are going to have fixed all of their magic diversity issues. One of the other things that separates the mid game from the late game is there is a lot more diversity in the types of things you will see from different nations. Uh, in that in the middle game, usually nations are going to be playing to their strengths and they will have big weaknesses. Um, in the late game, a lot of times nations will start covering up for those weaknesses. Um, so it's it's a pretty interesting time. Also in the late game, usually there's a lot more magic gems at play than you have in the mid game. Uh, so with that, we're going to talk about uh, a, a, a lot of the different factors. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is diplomacy. Um, in this particular game, I'm playing uh, what Late Age Falegra. And uh, I subbed into it. We were pretty small. I think we had, like, this much territory. So, I don't know, 10 or 12 provinces. Um, we got into a uh, coalition with Abyssia against Atlantis. And you can see we, we kind of recently just took Atlantis's cap, um, as well as a few of his territories up here. Um, what became uh, apparent to us... Uh, after that is that uh, Lemuria was enormous. He had the entire ocean system. He was eating up um, Arethia, who was above him. Here's Lemuria. And yeah, he had all these oceans. You can see we started taking it back on him uh, from him. And he was putting temples up in all of them. You can see the temples here. And so basically, as soon as the war ended with um, Philegra, I, I know how Lemuria works. Uh, Lemuria is a nation that goes through a rather weak period in the mid game. Uh, once you have counters, I mean, you need those counters. The early game, if you're just fighting them with, you know, like, vanilla troops, like, Mufflon, uh, Calvary, they'll just eat these guys. But if you have magic or thugs or whatever, and obviously we have these with our super combatants, as Falegra, um, you have pretty good counters until they evolve very, very specialized counters to deal with your stuff. So, yeah. Uh, anyway, we want to go ahead and take advantage of that uh, weak period they have. Uh, but also we want to team up on the game leader. So uh, the first kind of tenant in diplomacy um, is kind of in the uh, your first your first early game war should definitely be against a nation who you are strong against, or where you're doing some massive coalition on a game leader. Um, a lot of times by the middle game, somebody has kind of gotten very very big and they have to be dealt with. 
Um, and this is certainly the case here with Lemuria. Lemuria, if you leave them unchecked, will just be uh, an enormous, an enormous problem. Like if Lemuria had this whole island and all the oceans, and they started eating over here and putting forts up, you know, we could have a massive, massive problem to deal with. Um, so better, especially with pop kill nations, better to deal with them early. Um, and with that, there's there's really only a few things I want to stress. I mean, it's it's very important you understand at each point in the game who you're good against now versus who you'll be good against later. There could be a nation that you're not very good against now, but you're going to be even worse against them later. Um, and then there's some nations like Lemuria who we're going to be very good against now, but who will be very bad against later. I mean, late game, they can do um, mind hunt and stuff to kill my tyrants, um, and they can have other specialized counters to deal with them. Right now, they don't have anything. So this is definitely a nation that is weak versus me at the moment, but will be strong versus me later, uh, which is definitely a box to tick uh, in terms of looking for who to fight. Um, the other thing is uh, we want to be going after often a big player. That's at least my strategy. Um, if you have an, a weak player near you that you think you can pick off quickly and you're pretty secure on your other borders, uh, that can be a, a better choice, certainly. Um, but at some point, you have to start aiming at a big player. Um, but it really depends. Like, I, I probably could have attacked Abyssia here, but I don't think it would have been... I think in that time, Lemuria would have gotten bigger than I would have... Got, like, it would have taken me longer to conquer Abyssia than it would have for Lemuria to conquer Arethia. Um, and my advantage over Lemuria would pretty rapidly diminish. He had a bunch of research sites set up where he had indie mages researching and things like that. So, um, anyway, uh, so that, that's the other important thing is, uh, is understanding who's in the top one or two position, uh, and if you're not going after them, you need to be aiming to get at least as strong as them. Uh, but in this case, we're going after them. I th think it's just me and Arethia uh, going after them, though Abyssia and Ulm have said they might help, though I don't know if they actually will. Um... <clears throat> The, the other important thing is declaring war on time. A lot of times, I think if you're less confident, like if you don't, if you're not sure of the matchup, or you're not sure of, uh, your, your allies or, or things like that, you can be pretty hesitant in going to war. And especially against a big nation, like a big nation like Lemuria is huge. Why would I want to attack him? I don't want to piss off the pop kill because he'll throw troops endlessly at me. Well, you have to understand whether it's going to be better or worse later. If it's going to be worse later, then you better go ahead and make your move quickly. Um, if you're strengthening faster than they are, then yeah, you can take your time. Uh, but in this case, uh, we definitely have a very strong advantage at the moment. So that's an extremely important part of diplomacy. Um, the other thing I'll say on diplomacy too is there's, there's kind of two aspects to diplomacy. There is uh, what other people have agreed to. Right, so like the, the current agreements they have. Uh, and then there's also what's in their interest. Um, and the thing is, whatever they have agreed to is going to give them inertia. And the things that have the most inertia are actually being in a committed war. Like if you're in a committed war with somebody, there's a ton of inertia in that. And what I mean by that is it's difficult to get out cleanly. To get out cleanly, you have to agree on contested provinces. And that's actually kind of hard to do, uh, or at least to do quickly. Uh, so there's a ton of inertia in being in wars. There's also inertia in naps. Like, people are hesitant often to get out of naps. Uh, and even if you do get out, there's a few turn delay before you can do any. So anyway, that's one aspect to see diplomacy. The other aspect is there's also the forces that are acting on a nation, to kind of go with, continue with the physics example. Um, like, for Lemuria, there is pressure for people to attack him, right? But maybe at the time... Uh, when I was still uh, eating Atlantis, we might have had peace. And I think he was even attacking Ulm. Like, he was raiding into Ulm and things like that. And I was like, I don't even care. I'm just attacking you. Uh, we didn't have a nap or anything. I actually just attacked him, like, instantly. So for diplomacy, there's uh, the inertia, the current agreements you're in, or the current wars you're in. Uh, and there's also the pressures acting on you, the things that are compelling you to, to do things differently, to, to make a move. And... Uh, the best alliances you can be in are alliances that have a little, at least a little bit of inertia, right? Like that your neighbors are either committed in a war or they have a nap with you. Uh, but also where uh, in the long term, 
it makes sense, or at least in the medium term, it makes sense for them to stay allied with you. Like, you also want the forces on your side. So, uh, like, for all, for Ulm and for uh, Raga at this point, I am a small nation which can potentially take care of a large nation that is keeping at least some armies on their border and potentially, you know, if they tried to invade me, they could have to deal with tyrants, which they probably would rather not deal with. So that makes for a rather secure border. Everybody would be happy about a little small Falegra beating back an enormous Lemuria. That is something that is going to put very positive forces on my neighbor, on my neighbors. If I went after, you know, another small nation, which is not a threat, I'm not, it actually puts a lot less positive forces on my neighbor because what it really means is I'm going to become a bigger player and there's this weak point where they can attack me now. But if I attack Lemuria, I'm not really going to get much gold or anything like that. Uh, all I'm really going to get is beating down this big player. And, I, you know, in some ways it might be better to attack Abyssia. Um, but it's just, I'm just bringing this up to illustrate um, the, the diplomatic fact, like the, the choices you make are going to affect your diplomacy beyond whatever the current state is. Like, you can say, oh, why did they attack me? You know, uh, we had a peace agreement and I hadn't done anything to piss them off. And now they're attacking me. They're stabbing me in the back when I'm attacking Abyssia. Well, that's the thing you need to think about when you're attacking Abyssia. What kind of pressures are you putting on them? Like they could just be looking for a free meal. But I know Raga's attacking northward. I know Ulm is just turtling and building up his little blood army. And he's very, very worried about Raga. And he knows if he attacked me, Raga might attack him because he's a, a bigger late game threat than me. So attacking Lemuria is super safe. It's going to make all my neighbors happy. Um, and then because I already have naps with them, it's very unlikely they're going to violate them. Uh, or not violate them, but end them to declare war on me. And if they do, I have enough time to respond. So anyway, um, that is, I think, the bit on diplomacy. Uh, next, we're going to talk about um, probably the more important thing. Uh, and I think this is the core of the mid-game, is winning economic wars. Right. So now let's say you're in a war with somebody. Uh, the goal of being in war is to take their land and their resources, uh, ideally without expending much of yours, uh, and when possible, uh, taking their armies, uh, and otherwise, yeah, their armies and, and mages and stuff off of the board, uh, without losing much of yours, right? So you have kind of like two main resources, you have your territories and you have your armies, and you want to take both of them from the other player without losing yours. And that's kind of obvious, right? But... If we get into what does that actually mean, um, if you just do one doom stack and you roll in, well, you're not going to do a very good job at killing their land, though you will be trading probably reasonably efficiently with their armies. And I say reasonably because it's probably not optimal, because the second you make a big doom stack, you may force them to make a big doom stack, or you may just have them dodge your army, in which case you're not really trading your army versus theirs. All you're doing is taking their territory and infrastructure very slowly. So. Um, part of this is now we're going to talk about raiding. Uh, raiding is basically the idea of taking enemy territory efficiently. Um, it's not about taking or killing armies, it's about taking territory. And uh, to take territory quickly, you usually just have to kill PD, and oftentimes people are going to have, you know, uh, often they'll have like six, sometimes they'll have ten, Sometimes they'll have 20, and in some kind of extreme cases, they'll have, you know, 30, 40, or 50. Um, but they also may choose to move mages in. They may choose to move um, uh, small armies in to anticipate raiders. But anyway, that's basically what raiding is. So to raid efficiently, you need small little groups of dudes who can do things efficiently. So for example, um, having... I don't... I guess I don't have them here, but we'll just use this as a little test bed real quick. Mufflon Cataphracts are actually decent raiders. You put five guys on Guard Commander, and you just have this guy run in and attack. Uh, and voila, we have a raiding squad. This is going to kill uh, probably up to like 15 PD, if I had to guess. We're not actually doing that in this game, because I'm kind of poor, and we're using my Tyrants mostly for raiding, because they can go underwater and some other stuff, which is mostly what I'm doing at this time. But... If you need to, you can totally use these guys like this. Um, so anyway, that is a good example of a small raiding army. Um, 
Uh, one of the other things that's very good on raiding armies is stealthy, because you can get deeper into enemy territory and do like a big turn one alpha strike. Um, the other type of thing we can do, and I don't, yeah, we have an example of it here, is a thug. So this guy is a budget thug. He's designed to kill consoles that he comes up against. And uh, basically he has this shroud, because for this bless, the guy I subbed into, I probably wouldn't have done it this way. But anyway, he has a bless that gives regeneration and stuff. Uh, we're going to suffer some protection. Uh, but whatever, we've got regen on a pretty good chassis, and we're going to be killing stuff quickly. And this guy can probably kill pretty decent PD up to, I don't know, 12 or something. I think he, he'll get surrounded uh, and struggle at points, but anyway. Uh, this is a good example of like a very basic thug for raiding, though this thug is also set up for counter thug measures, because uh, Lemuria has consoles running around everywhere, and we're expecting actually that Lemuria will move here, and so we're going to kind of take take him out. But anyway, so this guy's kind of dual purpose, but thugs are one of the main ways where you can do uh, do raiding. We're actually using super combatants to raid, and we're just running through and knocking down all of his temples, and there's really not much he can do about it. Here's Enkelados, uh, who's got some some gear. Uh, we are a little bit vulnerable to apostasy. I think it works on dudes with shrouds. I'm assuming it does. I haven't actually tested it. don't exactly care enough about this game to test all of that out, but uh, anyway, we are just running around knocking down temples uh, before Lemuria's dominion is all over this lake. Um, but you could think of him like a thug. He's way overkill for this job. Well, kind of overkill, because he's going to get, like, diseased from apparitions, and then other people are going to paralyze thugs. So thugging against Lemuria is a little tricky, especially when consoles can, you know, jump out of your rice bowl at you. Um, but anyway, that's the main other form of raiding, is you have some good raid chassis that's going to jump in. Uh, there's basically two ways to raid, or three ra three ways to raid with thugs. Uh, you have uh, basically just marching in. You have guys who can cloud trapeze. We don't really have any, I don't think, on this nation. Uh, I guess these guys kind of could in a pinch if you forge them uh, some gear. Uh, so you can do magic phase attacks with cloud trapeze. Uh, or you can be stealthy and sneak in there. And that's another way to do deep raiding. Uh, deep raiding is good because it's going to kind of pull enemy resources away from the front line in order to counter raiders. So that's kind of important. Um, but anyway, that's uh, that's super important. Being able to take uh, provinces very quickly is an extremely important part of winning the economic war. Um, the final part of, of raiding is magic. So uh, you can do remote summon spells. Uh, we'll go through a couple of them real quick just so you know what they are. Um, Call of the Wild is one. It's a 15 gem spell. It summons some wolves. Uh, it's better when you target a forest province. Uh, they have a little werewolf leader who's not all that bad. Um, I think there's an air one. Uh, Call of the Winds. Uh, in some ways, this is better for patrolling because the these guys are pretty shitty warriors, but uh, they can kill you know a couple PD. If people are using really light PD and you want to use it on turn one or something like that, it can work. Um, there's also much heavier stuff you can do, like Ghost Riders up here, and then there's things in Blood you can do, like Horde from Hell. This is going to summon some imps with the devil. You get to keep these after the battle if they win. So uh, anyway, there, there are things you can do um, in terms of magic phase attacks. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about uh, is counter raiding, and counter raiding is super important. Um, if you're, whereas raiding is an extremely efficient way to take territory and money and gems from the enemy player, counter raiding is a way to prevent them from taking it to you. Um, the thing to understand for counter raiding is there's many different ways uh, that your enemy can move. Like if Lemuria, let's say this guy was not a super combatant, he was just a light thug, and let's say Lemuria wanted to attack me, right? He would have to guess which of all of the provinces I can move to, am I going to move to, and he would have to move um, his countermeasures to that province. Um, if he moves correctly, we get a bump. But unlike in this case, let's say there's really only four provinces I'm going to move. He has a one in four chance. Now, one thing you can do, um, and it's something if, if we're attacking him deeper inside his territory, it's something that's more possible, 
Um, it is possible for him to def to put countermeasures in each of the provinces I am likely to move to. If he does that, then there is a very high likelihood he is going to counter my raiding force, like this thug. It's really a super combatant. But if he does that, um, then I'm basically guaranteed to lose a raiding squad. And that could be a, you know, a reasonably sizable hit. It could represent a lot of gems. It could represent, you know, maybe like four or five hundred gold. Um, it could be a pretty sizable hit. Um, and it's also going to just remove one of the forces raiding him so he can focus his stuff on other things. So pretty important to be able to counter raid. This is the most basic way of doing it is anticipating where he's going to go um, and either moving somebody countermeasures to all of those provinces um, or to move it to some of them and hope you get lucky. Um, the problem with doing it is you're needing way more resources than he's deploying, right? So in this sense, raiding is drawing out a disproportional counter response. In other words, um, for him to catch me, he's going to have to do more, like a better thing than I have in four provinces, right? So that's like to have, for him to have a guaranteed chance of it. So, you know, it, it potentially is going to be like four times the investment to stop my investment. Um, and that's the kind of thing you do need to do often if you're getting graded. So um, to do this well, you need to have a good understanding of what's the like most cost-effective way to counter the particular type of rating threat you're dealing with, um, and then deploying it in mass enough to actually catch them with conventional map move methods. So um, that is basically the the first way, and you know you can do that with small armies. Uh, you can do that with thugs. Um, Oftentimes, if, if you're getting raided, like let's say you're getting raided by just the simple Muffle and Cataphract Raider, then um, it's very easy for Lemuria to figure out how many ghosts they need to efficiently kill five Cataphracts, and they can deploy those rather easily uh, to pick off those uh, Cataphract Raiders. So that's one way to counter it, is with small armies that are just big enough to efficiently kill the army you're using to raid. You can also counter it, you know, small armies can be countered by doing PD dumps where you anticipate where they're going to go and you put more PD than they would expect and that will work. Uh, oftentimes that's a kind of big investment depending on where you're putting the PD, but it's definitely something you can do. Um, you can send thugs in that are designed to counter an army, like you could send a thug in designed to counter the cataphracts. You could send a thug in designed to counter the thug that's raiding them. Um, a lot of times the ways you build a thug to raid is going to be able to handle a lot of kind of cheap shitty troops. And the way you build a thug to counter raid is usually you're planning on having a few thugs, like a few troops as a screen, while you're intending to kill a high value target quickly. Um, and oftentimes somebody who is designed to kill a high value target quickly um, will absolutely slaughter a guy designed to handle a lot of cheap shitty troops. So that's kind of the, the rock, paper, scissors there that we're dealing with. Um, and that's basically how, whoops, that's basically how you need to do counter thugging. Um, the other thing, and this is very important, is counter thugging you can do through normal map movement or you can do it through magic phase movement. If you have a thug with astral or with air, um, there's some other kind of ways to do it, but not really. Um, you can do magic phase attacks. Um, the nice thing about doing that is this thing with, if you're moving conventionally, the same thing applies for thugs. So I have to guess which of the four provinces are they going to go to. If you're doing a magic phase attack, you can guarantee almost uh, an interaction, right? You can guarantee you're going to land on top of the dude and you're going to cause a fight. There's only a few ways out of that. One is if they're in a province with a lab and they can magic phase out of there. Um, the other one is if they're stealthy, they can sneak out and dodge magic phase attacks. But I think that's about it. I mean, they can also do like returning spells and things like that. Um, but basically, you have a much, it's much easier to kill raiders uh, once you have magic phase attacks online. And that's an extremely important part of uh, mid game and counter raiding. Uh, is being able to do magic phase attacks. And you don't need many. Oftentimes, just having two guys who can run around doing magic phase attacks in the mid game will just grind the other person's mag uh grind the other person's raiding attempts kind of to a halt. So pretty important. Um the final way to deal with raiders, so we're still on the topic of counter raiding, is uh magic. 
itself, right? So not magic phase attacks, but using magic. So what are the things you can do? Well, um, you can do, wait, I think it's enchantment. You can do seeking arrow. This is a good way to kill kind of human uh, H or human type units. So if they're tougher than humans, it won't kill them. But otherwise you can kill the, the commander that is leading a raiding squad. And then you can just move troops in and you can kill them. So that's one way to do it. Um, another way, a similar style, is you can do things like uh, Mind Hunt, which are going to be pretty good at killing commanders if they're not astral. Um, another thing you can do, uh, and now we're out of... There's other assassination spells you can do, like Earth Attack. Um, Manifestation's another one. This isn't meant to be exhaustive, but these are just... This is to prime your brain to think about this thing right. Um, so these are ways to deal with uh, raiders. The other way to deal with raiders um, is to send an army at them, right? So you can do all the ones we already talked about, like all the raiding armies, like Horde from Hell you can do. Um, you can also do Send Horrors. Uh, where are you? Right here. Right, send Horrors, that works. Um, and actually the uh, Ghost Riders are pretty solid. So they're actually decent at... Uh, at counter raiding, because they can often kill raiders, depending on uh, what you're facing exactly. Because uh, basically you have to deal with the big lance charge, which can uh, give a hard time to a lot of different things. So um, that's basically magic. I'm sure there's other ways to deal with uh, raiding, or other types of magic to deal with raiding, but those are the ones I can think of at the moment. So uh, we talked about raiding, we've talked about counter raiding. Now we're going to talk about winning major battles. Um, in the early game, whether you're going to win a battle is largely dictated by how many troops you bring, by uh, the quality of the troops, by your bless, and by your pretender. In the mid game, all those things still matter. Uh, but what is going to start mattering more and more and more as the game goes on is what are the research targets you've hit uh, versus what your opponent has hit. And how do those mesh together with your troops and their troops so um, hitting, kind of timing your attacks with key research targets. Um, we'll go through a couple of them. A lot of these, uh, the key research targets are battlefield white spells, but not all of them are. Um, so some of the key ones uh, are, okay, here we go. Uh, fog warriors is one of the, the biggest key ones. If they don't have counters to fog warriors and you drop it early in the mid game in a fight, there's a very good likelihood you're going to win that fight if it would have been even remotely close otherwise. Um, this is These are more of late game spells, but like Army of Gold and Army of Lead are really good. Uh, Mass Protection is another pretty good one. Uh, it depends uh, largely on the base natural protection of your troops. Uh, but this can be really good, and this is something that definitely comes out in the mid game. So, so is Wooden Warriors. Wooden Warriors is very spammable. Uh, and definitely comes out in the early mid game. So uh, this is uh, definitely something that can change the outcome of a battle. Uh, it can make troops significantly better than they otherwise would have been. Um, on to evocations. There's some big evocations. Orb Lightning, Thunderstrike are all really uh, strong. So is Storm. These are all spells that can change the fate of a battle. Um, so can Earthquake. Dropping Earthquake on an unsuspecting target can definitely do that. Um, this isn't exhaustive, but these are just some examples of spells that once you hit them, they will just dramatically change the effect of a battle. Bladewinds can also do it depending on what you're fighting. Um, I don't think there's anything there. Uh, fire, Firestorm is something that can come out pretty early on a nation like Abyssia. Once Firestorm comes out, if you don't have the correct counter, you basically can't meet them in the field. Um, Unless you have a very specific counter with a lot of fire resistance or a ton of HP or a ton of HP and regen. Um, but anyway, this can be a very oppressive spell that can come out reasonably early. Uh, water, I don't think there's too much here. Anyway, those are uh, some pretty important spells from Evocation. Uh, for enchantment, there's a lot of ones uh, like Court of Skeletons uh, is something that a lot of nations are going to really rely on heavily in the mid game. Um, and this is going to dramatically change the course of a fight. Um, nations that have high death access for their mages uh, are going to be night and day different in terms of their strength before and after they hit Horde of Skeletons. So this is really important. Rigor Mortis can be really good. 
Um, if you're fighting a mage heavy army and you drop this and you're either undead or you just have better reinvigoration or you're just not relying on your mages as much, uh, this is going to make you win. It's basically a win spell. And then, uh, what up, we're on this, all the, the fatigue plays with grip of winter or, uh, heat from hell are also really strong. Flaming arrows can also be very, very good in the mid game. Uh, if you have a lot of archers. So uh, that's definitely something to keep an eye on. And uh, this Mass Flight also is something that comes out in the late mid game. Um, if the, your opponent doesn't have air access and cannot put up Storm, this can be extremely oppressive. Um, certain nations, if you outnumber your enemy and you cast Mass Flight, there's a very, very good chance you're going to win the battle. Um, but usually the nation that has the numbers advantage is going to want to cast Mass Flight. The nation that doesn't have the numbers advantage is not going to want the opponent to cast it, but it can be very, very strong. And uh, there's other good ones, Life After Death. And Nature, Mass Regeneration is pretty good, but this is really something more of like a late game spell. Fell Vapors can be very strong uh, if you're geared up to handle it, but your opponent isn't. Um... So you get the idea, we're not going to do like an exhaustive list here, um, but these are the types of things that if you have them up and your opponent does not, uh, or does not have a counter to them, um, you can basically win or lose fights off of this, and understanding which of these spells your nation has access to and when they'll have access to it based on your research is really important for winning mid-game battles. Um, because we're using super combatants, our ability to win battles is actually much more predicated on our construction, so the gear we can put on our guys, um, and the alteration, which are the buffs our guys can cast, like once we get Phoenix Pyre, we'll be in good shape in this particular game. Um, their Soul Vortex is also super important. And being able to put better gear on them is, of course, also super helpful. So, uh, anyway, that is basically it for, um... Uh, for winning major battles. Uh, the other kind of thing to talk about for major battles is uh, mage commitment. So uh, usually in the early game, and, and this has exceptions, you don't want to commit a ton of mages to fights. You want to maybe have one or two doing some kind of key thing you've researched early. By the mid game, uh, a lot of times the battles are going to be decided uh, by who has more mages. So that's definitely something to think about. Um, and it forces you, I mean, losing a ton of mages is a huge, in some ways, irreplaceable loss. Um, whereas you can often replenish troops faster than you can replenish mages. Um, yeah, so uh, it forces you into a kind of an interesting situation where you have to decide, uh, is it worth it for me to send all these mages? And on one hand, if you lose a battle, you're in deep shit. Uh, on the other hand... Uh, if you don't bring them, you're much more likely to lose a battle. So mage commitment is an extremely important part of mid-game fights. Uh, and the other thing to think about is just because you can win doesn't mean you really won, right? Like, just because you won a battle doesn't mean you won. Uh, winning a battle really means winning without taking a ton of losses. Because if you all basically wipe out each other's armies often, uh, it's bad for both of you. Right, for it to be good for you, ideally, you want to win so well that you hardly lose anything compared to what you're gaining. <clears throat> now, to do that well, you need to understand kind of the other nations, where they're at in their power curve, and whether you've hit a lot of your key research targets. Because, you know, if you're playing Kalem and you hit a very early Fog Warriors, you're just going to start deleting armies. Like, you're going to be so strong. And you have to take advantage of that right then, because later they'll have counters that will come up. And if you go after the right nation, you are going to just, you know, explode in power. So, uh, or in size. So anyway, that's an extremely uh, important thing to consider, is uh, making sure you don't just win fights, but you win them um, in, a, in, a, in a very, very compelling way, uh, with high efficiency. Uh... So I think we've basically talked about a lot of the things that you're going to need to win major battles. There's other details in terms of scripting troops and stuff. And, you know, honestly, there's a ton of things to talk about there. Uh, we're not going to go into that. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is taking infrastructure. Um, sometimes people will want to build only mages or like only elite troops. 
The problem is a lot of elite troops aren't terribly good at taking infrastructure. And one of the things I've seen a lot of people, and if you think back, if you're somebody who's watched a lot of my games, especially as they go into the late game, you'll usually see at least one player that has only a few big armies. Like, you know, as, as it gets to like turn 50, they've got one or two big armies. And the thing is, if if they lose a fair amount of any one of those big armies, they're not going to be able to take many forts. So what you need to think about is you're going to need like part of your army to win the battle, and then you're going to need another part of your army maybe following in behind or maybe even just built into it that's basically just siege chaff. Uh, the worst thing you can do is to have one of your most important assets, like a bunch of mages, a huge army, sitting on somebody's fort waiting for the walls to crumble for like four or five turns. All that's happening is you're getting more and more committed to this position where it's like, holy crap, I've had my guy sitting here three turns and I have to take this fort now because I'm so committed by having this big army sitting on it. Meanwhile, uh, they are piling up resources to kill you. And there's like a thousand things that can go wrong the longer you wait to take a fort. Um... If, on the other hand, you can move quickly, you can take a fort in one turn because you've thought about Siege Chaff, there's a lot of things that can go right. One is they, you know, they just lost a battle to you. Uh, they don't have other things in the region to properly defend. You can break through their fort and kill everybody inside, potentially. Uh, there's a lot of good things that can happen if you can take it very, very quickly. So... Uh, that's an extremely important dimension to measure your nation. Um, and if your nation has a weakness for that, like, uh, th we don't actually have a great nation for this. Um, none of these troops jump out as excellent siege chaff. These guys are okay, like they have a fair amount of siege strength, but they're super expensive. Um, these guys are not great siege chaff. There's really... Oh, wait, whoops. Okay, we down here. Sorry. These guys, they're still expensive. They have pretty good strength. These are kind of some of your better gold to siege strength. Well, not really. Really, we just have shitty gold to siege strength ratio troops here. So, like, if we stumbled across a Pale Ones province, it'd be super useful for us. Because we don't really have a lot of siege strength. Middle-aged Phalegra, you can raise huge armies. Uh, and I'm not a Phalegra. Phalegra expert by any means, but I do not believe we have that ability here in the late age. So uh, we distinctly suffer from a, a lack of siege strength. But there are nations that are even worse. Uh, some of the giant nations are worse. Uh, while giants are very good at sieging individually, uh, oftentimes they're disproportionately more expensive. Uh, though a lot of uh, giant nations do have access to a siege specialist. So... Anyway, those are very important dimensions to think about uh, for uh, for anyway for taking infrastructure quickly. Uh, let me talk a little bit more about why this is important. I've already talked about how you're very vulnerable while you're sieging a fort. Um, the other thing that's important is, let's say you're in a coalition and you're teaming up on the big player. If you can't siege stuff quickly, that is going to determine how much of the shares you get versus how much let's say the other player gets. If you can siege things quickly and take infrastructure quickly, uh, once you are starting to win a war, you will win it very quickly because you'll be taking a bunch of their stuff. Um, if you can't take things quickly, then either your allies will take all their stuff or the war is going to take a long time for you because as you're slowly taking their crap, they're going to be building up a lot more crap to attack you with. Or... Uh, and, and, okay, and then maybe they do that and they kill more of your stuff and your stuff gets even more depleted, but you bring more stuff in, you start sieging down even more stuff. Uh, eventually, as somebody recognizes that the nation you're attacking is a dying animal, uh, they will choose to attack you and now there's a, a coalition you didn't want, because this is a nation that you've now basically beaten, and they're gonna come in and take your crap. Right? So, being able to siege down efficiently is super duper duper important. It's actually one of the things I kind of struggle with in this game a little bit is Flegra. I don't have a lot of good siege troops at the moment. Um, and it could be, again, I'm a Flegra noob, but 
that is uh, the final aspect of winning the economic war. So to summarize, uh, to win the economic war, you need to be able to raid, you need to be able to prevent yourself from getting raided with counter-raiding, um, and you need to um, be able to win major battles, uh, and you need to be able to take infrastructure quickly. Those are kind of the key components. Um, all these are things that are impacted by Pretender Design 2. Uh, having a Pretender who can magic phase attack is a great way to fill holes you have in counter raiding. Like, if you're very vulnerable to raiding, um, as a nation, you don't have any very good countermeasures. Having a Pretender who can Cloud Trap piece, it's, it's a great solution. Um, but a lot of times, people have countermeasures, but they don't really think about it, right? Like, you may have access to Mind Hunt, you're fighting a nation which is going to be doing a lot of raiding, you're not making it a priority to do it, to get the research to do it. So, uh, or, you know, you can cast Seeking Arrow, but you've never cast the spell before in your life, so you never do it, and you're getting killed by raiders. So anyway, those are those are all important things to think about. Uh, the next uh, the next thing we're going to talk about, and now we're getting to, to kind of more mundane and less important topics, I think, is... Uh, Building up your economy, an extremely important part of the mid-game is getting your research up. To be a contender in the late game, you need to get your research up to like a thousand research per turn pretty quickly. Once you're at a thousand to two thousand research per turn, you kind of start getting diminishing returns on research. Uh, and what I mean by that is eventually you're going to research everything, especially if you're above two thousand research per turn, you'll definitely research everything uh, in a long game. Um, at a thousand, though, you're going to be able to hit your most important research targets reasonably quickly in a game. So uh, getting up there is important. Don't ever start turning off your research engine if you can help it. There's times when you need to uh, until you're up to a thousand research per turn. Um, so that's and you know this is like very high level kind of vague advice, but you have to get that engine going. Now, how do you get your research uh, your research engine going? Well, if you have magic scales, uh, then you're kind of in a good position to crank out low-cost, uh, shitty researchers, and they're going to benefit from... Uh, like, this guy is going to be so much better with magic scales than he's going to be with drain. Like, with drain 3, he's going to give you two research a turn, which is nothing, right? But you take magic scales, and all of a sudden, he's not a bad 70 gold researcher. Um... Basically, the more drain you take, the better mages you want to get to research. Uh, the better your mages are, the less reliant you're going to be on making um, magic items. Like here, we've got a Lightless Lantern that we're putting on, uh, Alquils. Uh, we don't have a ton of magic scales, we just have one. The difference between this guy, 12 research, and 6 research with a Quill is phenomenal, right? Like, it's huge. So, uh, anyway, we are definitely making a lot of these. You know, the trade-off, though, is you're not turning your gems into things that are giving you immediate military power. You're turning them into things that are giving you research. Uh, but you can see we don't have a huge income. Like, 2,000 is kind of good, but it's not great. Uh, if you have a big income, then what you're able to do with that income is leverage it into using your gems for other things than basically making magic items. Like, if you watch my Scalaria Let's Play... We have very, very few magic items. We could be turning our death gems into skull mentors and getting our magic up that way. Uh, and sometimes that's an, a, a strategy you definitely want to do. But for Scalaria, we had a huge income. Uh, we had magic scales. And we had lots of cheap researchers. It was not a situation where we needed to do uh, a bunch of, of these items. But if you're in a nation with like low income... You're not going to be able to have a ton of researchers. You really need to get up to like a thousand research points a turn, and you're not going to get it just by recruiting a handful of shitty mages. You really need to crank out research items. So that's an extremely important part of the mid-game, is to understand what kind of research nation you are. Are you a research nation that can crank out a ton of crappy mages with high magic scales and have phenomenal research? Or are you a nation with, you know, not much money or... Uh, you've got train scales, and you have to compensate with magic items and getting them that way. So uh, anyway, that's important. The other thing, and I'll just say this um, as we're talking about research, is oftentimes there's a trade-off. Are you going to get mages that are useful, or are you going to get mages that are cost-efficient researchers? 
And uh, when you find a nation that has both, like they have a nation that's cost-efficient researcher and is useful, uh, that's a very, very valuable thing. Uh, so anyway, that's something to look out for. Uh, next point on building an economy is site searching. So I've got a lot to say here. Um, by there's, there's always a question with nations, do you want to site search in the early game? Uh, it's going to be a trade-off with what do you want to be doing with your mages? Do you want them to be having, do you want them to be researching early objectives? Uh, or do you want them site searching? Or if you're a blood nation, do you want them blood hunting? And those are all trade-offs you have to make throughout the game. Um, but, uh, in the mid game, you have to re, you have to site search. Right? If you're not site searching your stuff in the mid game, you're gonna lose. Um, one of the best tools you can do to figure out how you're doing site searching is to hit F1. Um, and it's going to, if you hit tab, it will toggle whether you see the commanders in that region or not. Um, and we want to look at the view without any of the commanders. So, uh, if we do that, we can see which sites we've site searched. And you can see we still have a lot of work left to do. But, um, all these sites that I have site searched are in my homeland. Like, these are all my core provinces. All these ones that I haven't are things that I've just conquered recently. Right? So, um, we will be going there, but we're not going there yet. And, like, while I would like to be researching, I was site searching with my tyrants as they run around, I'm much more anxious to knock down these temples. So, site searching is super important in the mid game. First message with, with that is there's a kind of like a do you or do you not want to do it? Is it worth it in the early game to site search? And you have to answer that for your specific nation. In the mid game, there's no question. You must site search all of your core provinces. Now, uh, as we get into how to actually do that, uh, there's a lot of different ways. So, uh, one, uh, one way to site search is sometimes you'll have a nation with a lot of, uh, a lot of different path, low level paths on one mage. These mages are going to find a ton of sites when they walk around in a site search, right? Because there's a very high probability of low level magic sites uh, being found rather than high level magic sites. Like you'll find, I think about half of the sites are level one sites. So uh, anyway, this guy is gonna find uh, at least twice as many sites than the ma than a mage with the same number of paths. So this guy has three paths, but all in one suit. So uh, if he had was three fire, uh, he would find about half as many sites as this guy. So this guy's going to find a lot, but he's going to do an incomplete job site searching, which means he's going to miss a lot within each of these different paths. And if you want to go back and get them, you're going to have to site search over what he's done. And the fact that he already site searched one is going to be kind of meaningless. Whereas, if you have like somebody like this, he's going to do a very complete job site searching fire, earth, and, and death, though death not quite as complete. Basically, you want to site search up to three. Is the simple the simplest rule is site search up to three in all provinces if you don't want to miss like ninety nine percent of the gems. Like that will get ninety nine percent. If you want to be more technical, you can search through the forums and people will tell you. I don't even honestly know what they are. Um, the the only other kind of basic guidance is the types of terrain that are more preferred for a given type of uh for a given path like uh swamps are more preferred for death you definitely want to site search them at least up to three and maybe up to like four things like forests which are better for nature uh, you want to make sure you get up to three for nature things like mountains uh, you want to make sure you get up to three in earth uh, those are the just most basic ideas of site searching. Um, and now with that in mind, um, the other way to site search. So we've talked about site, site searching shallow, which is a very good way early to get your magic economy going, but it doesn't do a very complete job. We've talked about site searching deeply, uh, which is good in terms of it does a complete job, but oftentimes uh, it's slow because a lot of times, like this guy is an exception. A lot of times you'll just have like one high path or two high paths on a mage. So you're going to have to send a lot of different mages through if you want to get all the different magic paths researched, which is fine. That's like totally fine. Um, the final way to site search, and this does a very complete job, though it's very expensive, um, is casting the site searching spells. Uh, the site searching spells are, we'll pull them up here. 
They are uh, Auspex. The, a lot of these are in Thaumaturgy. They are Hospex. Oh, wait, where are you? Haruspex. Uh, they are Augury. They are No More. Uh, am I missing any? I think I got all of these. Uh, they are uh, Voice of Apsu for water. There's also another one for water, Voice of Tiamat. This one can only be cast in the water, and it will reveal all of the elemental paths there. But it's expensive, but it's a good value. It's a, it's a really good asset for water nations. Uh, okay, Voice of Tiamat. Then you've got Dark Knowledge, which is a, a death one. And then finally, in Evocation, we have the Astral one, uh, which is Arcane Probing. And they're all a little bit different in terms of their gym cost and their range and magic path requirements, but uh, that is another way to do it. Now, when should you do that versus when should you not? Um, what I will say is if you have researched up to two in a province, like if I were thinking about casting No More here, No More will take it all the way up to nine. In, in reality, if it's four, you never want to cast go from like four to nine. I don't even think there's any sites you can find, maybe like one. Uh, and People will probably chime in in the comments and, you know, say the one exception or something. But basically, if you're at four, you never want to do it. If you're at three, you basically never want to cast the sight searching spell. If you're at two, if you get lucky, you would, I mean, you can find a very good level three sight by casting no more on this province. Um, if you do the expected return of the mage turn and... Uh, the three gems you spent, uh, it is not a very good return on investment casting no more on this province. Um, however, if you have a province that's only one, uh, a lot of times it's much easier to justify um, casting no more on a province because, or any of the, the site searching spells, because uh, there's a much higher chance that you're going to find a site, because you potentially could find a level 2 site or a level 3 versus only a level 3. And level 3s are somewhat rare. So, uh, anyway, that's all part of the calculus to factor in. The other part of the calculus is, you know, like casting it on a farmland is lower value than casting it on, you know, the specialized terrain that you're likely to find that kind of site in. So, uh, that is the final way to kind of do site searching. Uh, and I have one more thing to say about site searching. So we've kind of talked about the different ways to do it. The other thing to think about, uh, and this is really important, is uh, each nation is in their mages going to have kind of like a, a certain set of magic paths that it's going to have easy access to. Uh, and outside of that, it's going to have magic paths that it doesn't have access to. So let's just say, and this is not a fair summary, but let's just say that Falegra, we have good access to fire, uh, air, earth, and death. Uh, and we can throw in water, because I know our oppressors get some water, and we have moderate access to that. Let's just say water, whatever. So let's say those are the things we have access to, like four paths, or five paths. If we site search all of our provinces for those, we're only going to be getting like four or five, let's say it's four paths we have good access to. We're only going to be getting four out of eight of the, the total, like, four, four eighths of all the gems we could be getting. So if you were to look at our total gem income, if we site search for only the things that this nation had, like, very good access to, uh, we'll get, like, four eighths of the gems, or five eighths of the gems. If we site search for everything, we get almost twice that. So um, part of the mid-game is you definitely need to site search um, all the things that your nation has access to. But you also have to start figuring out ways, and this will be more towards like the middle of the mid-game and the late mid-game, to site search things that you don't have access to, right? And that means solving some of the magic diversity issues that your nation has. Um, yeah, and that's going to lead us into our next topic, which is really how do we prepare for the late game? And, you know, part of the preparing for the late game is just doing well in the mid-game, you know, site searching, researching, having a big territory, all that stuff. The other really important thing uh, for the late game, though, is you have to understand what the late game is. The late game is this period where um, basically everybody's going to be making up for all of their gaps. And by very, very late in the game, everybody has everything. 
Um, and so then it's like a real struggle. And if you're somebody and the everything, everybody has everything war and you don't have everything, you're in trouble. So if you don't have basically to, to be a contender in a, in a game that goes really, really late and not all games do, uh, this isn't completely true, but it's kind of true. You need to have site searched all the different paths. Maybe not all the paths in every province, but you need to be site searching everything. Um, because that is going to dramatically affect your gem income. It doesn't matter what your nation has access to, because you're going to be needing the other gems to do other things. And if you don't have those gems, then you're not going to be getting the mages that those gems give you, uh, or casting the spells or forging the items that those gems give you. And those are potentially going to be a very key part of your victory. Um, and even if you can't use them, you could alchemize them into something else. Uh, now, how you actually do that uh, is going to be a bit tricky. Um, one of the easiest ways to do that is to solve a lot of your magic path diversities in your pretender. Like for Felegra, you don't have nature, so it's something you want to consider getting in your pretender. Uh, for other nations, you can have a rainbow pretender that can solve tons of your, your issues. Um, if you're building a rainbow, uh, to build a rainbow well, you need to not only know like what paths your nation has access to, um, you need to really understand magic path boosting. Uh, there's a really good guide by Telos on magic path boosting. And uh, yeah, it's, it's super solid. Uh, you should check it out. Uh, if I haven't mentioned it, uh, you can just Google it, but if you don't Google it, you can put in, uh, ask me and I'll put a, a, a link in the description. Uh, but I'll, I'll just do an example. So for fire, if you want to cast fire, what is the minimum amount of fire you need on a mage so you can climb all the way up the fire ladder? So if you're fire three, you can't make any of the boosters, right? Because the first booster to make is the hat, which is fire four. If you have a fire death cross path, you can make the fire death booster, and that will get you up to four, at which point you can make the hat, and now you're fire five. Once you're fire five, you can do uh, king of elemental earth, I mean king of elemental fire, uh, and now you have a fire five mage, you can toss all that stuff on, and he's up to fire seven. So you fully climbed up. Now, uh, there is another way to get up fire. You can get all the way up fire from being uh, fire two, if you have the fire death cross path. If you have the fire death cross path, you can summon a flame spirit, and this will get you up to fire three. Um, and if you're fire three, you can now, uh, with this flame spirit, because he's a fire three mage, you can now put that skull on him, and he will now be fire four. Uh, and then him as fire four, he can put, he can forge the hat now, which will get him up to fire five. Uh, and then from there, he can summon the King of Elemental Earth, and again, you're up to Fire 7. Um, if you look at uh, the, the the Magic Path boosting, uh, there's most of the time people don't think about it with unique items, but if you plan for that nation on going up to unique items uh, rather early, you can often consider uh, forging them, which will give you um, a... Uh, a, a usually a much easier way to climb up into uh, some of the harder paths. But uh, a lot of nations do not want to rush uh, unique magic items. But uh, if you're a nation that does, for whatever reason, um, then it does make magic path boosting a bit easier. Um, but that's just one example. So understanding all of the magic path boosting is pretty important for knowing, okay, with the default mages I get in my nation, how high up in each of the magic paths can I get? Um, and uh, if when you're designing your pretender, how high up can your pretender get in each of those magic paths? There's other important things to know for magic path boosting, like if you get into nature, uh, you can do uh, summon fairy court with just nature five, and this is going to get you an air three nature three mage. So only by being in nature you can get into air, uh, which is kind of rare. It's not always like that, but there's other examples of that, like in blood. With demon lords, you can do that. So uh, anyway, solving the puzzle uh, for your nation, how are you planning on dealing with all of your magic diversity issues so that you are not only able to site search um, many different uh, magic paths uh, on your lands, but you're also able to reach high levels of magic for many of the different paths 
Um, that is an important puzzle to solve, and you must take steps towards doing this in the mid game. Um, though, you know, it also involves potentially your pretender god and decisions that you made far earlier. Um, indies are also an important source for solving some of your magic diversity issues, though you can't really count on many of the magic paths on indies except nature. Though it's somewhat common to find astral indies. And water, if you're in the, the ocean, you can find those somewhat regularly. Okay, so that is uh, basically uh, magic income and diversity. Uh, the next thing we'll talk about is global control. And global control is an important part of the mid-game. Um, knowing, uh, basically figuring out what globals you think you have a good shot controlling based off of your income at a certain point. So like looking at this, I have a ton of water income and a ton of water gems, so I have a good shot of controlling a, uh, a water global if I choose to do it, but I don't really have any high water mages, which is kind of a, a funny situation. So uh, anyway, that's what that is. Uh, but anyway, based off your current income, uh, that should affect your decision in terms of what are the globals you want to control. A lot of the globals people want to control are the gem-generating globals like Mother Oak, which you can get very early in the game, or some of the other ones like Eternal Pyre or uh, Earthblood Deepwell. Those are all other good things to put up. Um, yeah, there's, there's a ton of good globals. I'm not really going to do a global guide, but um, depending on what your nation is and, and kind of what your objectives are. There's there's a lot of kind of good globals to put up, and controlling them is an important part of getting ready for the late game. Um, next, for research priorities, uh, this is a really important thing. So, like, I'm neighboring Abyssia. I know that when he has Firestorm, if I don't have Firestorm, well, I have Tyrant, so I don't really care. But, you know, if I didn't have Tyrants... Uh, I know that I couldn't bring a conventional army against him while he has Firestorm. And, you know, Tyrants can't break through walls, so at some point I have to bring a real army. And I can't bring a re real army versus Firestorm until either I have Firefend, so I have to get up to Enchantment 8, or uh, Armies of Gold, which is uh, Enchantment, I mean, Alteration 9, or uh, Warriors of Niflheim. Or this, I forget where it is. Gaia's Blessing. I think it's Enchantment. Yeah. Or that one. So, anyway, uh, yeah, based on which, those, those were all different ways to deal with fire, like Firestorm. One of them was Earth Magic, one of them was Nature Magic, one of them was Fire Magic, and one of them was Water Magic. And if I knew this was like an imminent threat I had to deal with, then uh, it's important that that is a factor in determining what research I do. And like, if I know I'm going to need... Now, in this case, I don't know I need to go to war with Abyssia. I was just kind of drumming it up as an example. But if I did, that's something I would have to think about. Um, which magic path am I going to research so that I can deal with that threat? You know, verse Ohm, I need to think, how am I going to deal with uh, Vampire Cancer uh, and Skelly Spam? Reverse Raga, you have Blood Magic uh, and uh, Flying Zayadens. But uh, anyway, uh, understanding... I, I think th there's a big trap I fall into a lot. I still fall into it. I have like things that I want to do like because they'll be fun. I'm like, oh, wouldn't it be fun if I controlled Arcane Nexus? When in reality, Arcane Nexus is going to give me some gems. Uh, it's going to piss everybody off and make me, them want to kill me. Uh, and it's not necessarily going to help me that much when battles are taking me in for infrastructure. While on the other hand, you know, getting something like Army of Gold uh, may make it where like nobody can even fight me in a battle. Like I'm just going to conquer people after people after people. And that can be a much bigger deal. So, uh, you know, for each nation it can be different. Sometimes it's going to be, okay, getting Tartarians up, or sometimes it's going to be, you know, dropping uh, Flames from the Sky, or Murdering Winter, or, you know, some other spell that uh, is going to just murder people like Astral Tempest. There's a ton of different things you can do. But uh, what you need to understand is who you're fighting, what they're weak against, 
what your nation can do. Uh, and pick your research targets according to what is going to allow you to decisively defeat the enemy. And I know that's kind of generic, but uh, I can't tell you the number of times I've... Like, my a great example of this is my Late Age Elm game. When I, re I was fighting uh, Abyssia off and on for a while, and Lemuria had great fire access, so they had Firestorm coming up in every fight, and I never freaking re uh, researched Army of Gold until the very end. Because I always had something else I wanted to do. That's the, actually the game I was thinking of when I was talking about Arcane Nexus. I went and researched this. It was a huge mistake. Huge mistake. I mean, yeah, it was okay because I got this spell up and it's awesome and all. But it didn't really help me win the game. Like, hardly at all. Um, what I really needed was Army of Gold. I can't even count the number of troops I lost because I didn't have that. Mages, I lost everything. Um, unfortunately, I was big enough that I was still able to win the game that time. But uh, I totally could have lost it because I almost threw it away by researching the wrong thing. Um, so anyway, that's an important part of getting ready for the late game. Uh, the decisions you make in terms of what are the major research priorities you're going to go after. By major research priorities, I mean what are the things you're going to be going to 8 or 9 in first. Those are very important decisions to make. Because there's usually very good things at Research 8 and 9 in most paths. And choosing can be very, very influential uh, in how the, the mid-game and late-game are going to play out. Um, a very important part of that is anticipating threats. Uh, because, you know, again, I was saying you have to think about which nation you're fighting. Um, and this is one of the things where, honestly, you just need a lot of experience. Because if you don't really know all the different things Ohm can do, because Ohm can do a lot of things. Like an experienced Ohm player, and I, I'm not even sure I consider myself one. Um, an experienced Ohm player can do a lot of stuff. I mean, like I'm kind of experienced, but I'm sure there's still a lot of tricks I don't know. And the more tricks people know, and the more different things you can do, and the more crazy stuff a, a given nation can do, um, the harder you're going to have a time, the harder a time you're going to have countering them. Um, and all they have to do is they have to find one or two really good things that you can't counter, and you're kind of screwed. Um, so knowing those for all your neighbors, kind of synthesizing that into who's the bigger threat uh, of all your neighbors, you end up having to kind of cumulate, cumulate all that into making a decision. Uh, about what you're going to go for in terms of research targets. So, anyway, that's a that's another final kind of super important part of the mid game. Um, yeah, I, I think that's that's kind of where we're going to leave it off here. Um, I think this last part I think was a little rambly and less important than the first part. I'll, I'll just go over again kind of the the bullet points of all this. Uh, diplomacy, you got to put yourself in a winning position. Uh, attack people that you're strong against or, or, and I think more importantly, form a coalition a, against the top player. Um, or eat somebody weak to you so that you become a top player. Those are all options. But um, an extremely important part of that is knowing who you're good against uh, now versus who you're going to be good against later or weak against later. Um, then we talked about winning the economic war, which involves raiding, counter-raiding, uh, how to win major battles, which has a lot to do with mages and the spells you've researched, and then uh, taking infrastructure, which basically you need to have uh, efficient siege troops so you can take things in one to two turns. That's kind of, I don't think I said that at the time, but like forts, you need to be looking at taking them in one to two turns, if you can. Um, otherwise, you're going to be playing, paying kind of a high cost. Um, next, we talked about building an economy with uh, site searching and research and how to do that. Uh, and then finally, we talked about preparing for the late game with magic income, uh, diversity, fixing all the diversity, magic diversity issues in your nation, uh, and then research priorities. Uh, so all the different super combatants. Uh, you know, how do you... How, okay, actually, I didn't talk about that, kind of. Um, so the other thing, and it's one of the things I've been leaving out of this guide, some nations get super combatants in the mid game. A lot of nations don't. Uh, in the late game, everybody's going to be having super combatants. That's any good anyway. And uh, you need to figure out how you're going to get it. The, you can get super combatants through Tarts, uh, Tartarian Gate. Uh, you can get it through all of the 
all of the elemental kings or queens are really good. So like earth, fire, water, um, air. These are all super combatant possible. So those those are all chassis. Uh, you have the Tartarians. Uh, in Blood Magic, you have a few. The Demon Lords can be super combatants. Uh, the Devils, Father Ill Earth, Bind Ice Devil can be one. Bind Arch Devil can be one. Vampires can borderline toe the line for being a, a super combatant. More like they're like very good thugs uh, against the right armies, at least. Um, there's more, but uh, it's important you understand for your nation how you're going to get access to them. Because uh, you definitely need... Oh, golems are also kind of on the low end of super combatants. Golem construction right here. So, um, anyway, there's a lot of different options for super combatants, but uh, you need to figure out what you're going to do uh, for your nation. That's another important part of mid-game research priorities. You don't have to do it, but it's something to think about in terms of preparing for the late game. Uh, and then finally, we have uh, research control. I mean, uh, I'm sorry, global control. So a lot of times in the mid game, you want to be focused on, uh, not want to, a lot of nations want to focus on uh, the Jim Jim globals because they're really good in the mid game. Uh, in the late game, you'll focus on different things, things that are, that are going to actually close the game out and win the game for you. Um, those can be, you know, if you're like an undead nation, those can be things like uh, Utter Dark, which if you can keep this up and you're a pop kill nation, you've basically won the game. Uh, they can be things like, uh, if you remember my Lemuria game, we won basically with uh, Vengeful Waters. That can be really good. Uh, there's other stuff like Wrath of God can be really good. Uh, there are other really cool situational things you can do, like uh, Enchanted Forest can be kind of cool, where it spreads Dominion and causes uh, little indie attacks near there. There's a bunch of other cool things that you can use to close out the end game with. Uh, but anyway, that's not really what we're talking about. The, the mid game is usually a lot of the Jim Jim globals, and those are going to set you up not only to have a strong mid game, but a strong late game. Uh, but understanding when and if you should cast them and how much to put in them. Uh, I, I don't know if I can, I'm really ready to do a guide on that right now, but that's just an important part of setting yourself up for the late game is having a good gym income. But honestly, too, uh, controlling the go the globals, you build that off the back of good site searching, which is kind of the, one of the most important parts of the mid game. So uh, anyway, this is now a kind of long guide. Uh, I hope you have learned something from it. And uh, yeah, the the final thing I will say in closing is the most important part of, of what I went through is winning the economic war with raiding, counter raiding winning major battles and taking infrastructure. Those are very important metrics to look at your nation when you're preparing the game. Like when you're when you're going through and you're looking at your nation, how am I gonna build it? You need to identify how your nation is gonna do all those things. Uh, and if you haven't done it, then you don't understand your nation yet because that's an important part of figuring out what gaps your god needs to fill. Same thing goes for magic diversity. You know, how are you gonna solve the magic diversity puzzle in the middle game? That is another important thing to figure out when you're designing your god. Uh, but anyway, hope you've enjoyed. See you next time. Good luck in your games.